let us end this lengthy, lengthy, lengthy segment on Katie Baker. Ms. Baker got good news. <clears throat> Ms. Baker is a journalist who works for BuzzFeed News. Now, for those of you who hear BuzzFeed and immediately have a visceral reaction, BuzzFeed News is actually a fairly reputable organization. They are not the same as BuzzFeed. BuzzFeed News does actual journalism. They put in work. Ms. Baker is a journalist. And five years ago, she wrote a story. She wrote a story about a woman by the name of Megan Rondini. Megan Rondini was, by all accounts, very similar to another individual we speak, we've spoken about before. I won't say their name. But she was very lawful. In fact, her childhood nickname was Rules Rondini because she uh, was such a stickler for following the rules of board games and games that she was playing. She was very adherent to the, the rule of law. Ms. Rondini ended up attending University of Alabama. Alab University of Alabama uh, is in Tuscaloosa. Uh, Tuscaloosa. Megan was, by all, uh, by all accounts, a lovely woman. She would spend nights when she wasn't studying, driving her drunk college friends and anyone, if she would find them out, you know, walking the street in need of a ride. She was everybody's designated driver. She would take care of anyone. She'd pick them up. She'd make sure they got home safely. Um, until the night of, <clears throat> until, well, one night in July of 2015, Megan found herself in that situation. She found herself walking the street in a slightly inebriated state. She was pretty close to blackout drunk. Well, an individual pulled up next to her and offered her a ride home. That individual we would later identify as... <clears throat> well, T.J. Bunn Jr., a.k.a. Sweet T. Sweet T, Mr. Bunn Jr., was the child of a well-to-do businessman and a well-to-do businessman unto his own right. And when I say well-to-do, I'm not saying they have a <clears throat> you know, that he, he, he's, he's doing okay. I'm talking, they are a significant donor to the University of Alabama level well-to-do. Their family is rich, folks. Really rich. Mr. Bunn Jr. found Ms. Rondini walking the street in a highly inebriated state in which... He offers her a ride home because he and a friend had seen her leaving downtown Tuscaloosa all by her lonesome. Now, Ms. Rondini couldn't recall why she, how she had ended up in Sweet T's white Mercedes that night on the way to his mansion. Which, by the way, I come from a gun family, right? It's, 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 it is not a, it's not necessarily a deficit of character when one is a hunter. 
but there is a type of hunter that is indicative of a type of character one possesses. His mansion is, <clears throat> shall we say, coded in his hunting conquests. Tusked, stuffed tusked elephants, hippos with their mouths wide open, rearing up, taxidermied lions, these sorts of things. He's a big game hunter. I have opinions about these people, uh, coming from a gun family myself. I understand that big game hunting adds to conservation uh, fundraising efforts. I'm not uh, foreign to that particular argument. I argue that why don't you just donate the money to conservation efforts then? There's no need for it. It's indicative of a character pertaining to an individual who has a need for domination that is an unhealthy level. And this comes from somebody who is intimately familiar with domination and submission, the psychology and practice thereof. You show me a big game hunter, and I'll show you somebody who you probably shouldn't be alone in a room with. They tend to be very unstable individuals in a few regards. Now, <clears throat> Ms. Rondini, in the time that it took for Sweet Tea and his friend to pick her up off the street and drive, offer to drive her home, but drive to his own mansion, managed to sober up. Enough at least to know that she didn't want to have sexual relations with him, but <clears throat> he was attempting to get her to his bedroom. So a stand-up individual, right? Real, real stand-up guy. He sees a drunk college girl on the street and he thinks, hey, I can get my dick wet. Definitely the best of people. Megan, on the other hand, had other ideas. She didn't want to go quietly into that good night, as it were. <sighs> so, she climbed out the second story window, falling along the way. She essentially escaped. She ran. She climbed out of the second story window and started booking it, but realized she didn't have her keys. So she climbs back up, finds his keys to his Mercedes, climbs back down, looking for her keys in his car, realizes that she might need money to get home, she scrounges $3 out of his car and along the way finds his handgun in the car. Deciding that she needs protection, she takes said handgun. Along the way, Megan, being unfamiliar with firearms herself, accidentally discharges the firearm. Upon accidentally discharging the firearm, she decides that it was probably best that she not be in possession of said firearm and drops it. She then manages to proceed her way to home. She manages to get a friend. She manages to get in the vehicle. She manages to get out. Okay? On the way, her friend asks her when she picked her up, was that consensual? And Megan hesitated apparently. And the friend pushed and said, quote, like 
Did you want to? Because the friend believed that she had been sexually assaulted, given her inebriated state, given everything that had just occurred, the friend did what a friend should do and pushed a little. And Megan said no. So the friend took her to the emergency room. Everything by the book, right? She escaped. You may have been sexually assaulted. We need to go to the emergency room. Once at the emergency room, the police were notified Everything is down the checklist. This is exactly what you do. Right? They went to the hospital for a forensic exam. <clears throat> Middle of the night, having jumped out of this man's second story window of his mansion, instead of going to sleep and putting it off another day, Megan, the trooper that she fucking was, stayed up and did a police interview. She did everything that she's supposed to do. The rape kit found that she had had sex. So, the police haul Mr. Bunn Jr. in for an interview. At his leisure. Because, again, as I pointed out, Mr. Bunn Jr. and Mr. Bunn Sr. are very well off and influential individuals within the Tuscaloosa community and high level donors to the University of Alabama. He maintained that the sex was consensual. And thus, it being Alabama, and Alabama having no idea what the idea of consent even involves, doesn't really give a shit that this woman couldn't even remember having sex with him. She had no memory of the incident. It was the ER that noted there had been sexual activity. She came sober while he was trying to get her to his bedroom. And thus, she believed that they were going to have sex and that she didn't want to have sex with him. And that's why she tried to escape then. Little did she know that she had already been raped and was just going for round two. The police... <clears throat> following Alabama's, quote, archaic rape laws, state that victims of rape in Alabama must, quote, earnestly resist their attackers. And the investigator who interviewed Megan decided that since she had not physically fought back against Mr. Bunn Jr., since she had indicated that she had neither kicked nor hit him, was not the victim of rape. The official conclusion of the investigation was that no rape had occurred. But wait, so many of you were ahead of me. Yes, we're fucking going there. Instead of building a case against Mr. Bunn Jr., the investigator begins building a case against Megan. Questioning her for multiple crimes she wasn't even aware that she had committed, nor was she aware she was being investigated for. She believed she was participating in an interview for her rape. Later, when she filed a civil suit against Mr. Bunn Jr., she learned the only way 
to escape prosecution for her alleged crimes up to and including felony firearm charges. I would ask those of you not to jump ahead. I would ask you to not do that. It is kind of annoying as a storyteller, just as an aside, when you are actually knee deep in a fucking storytelling and people just drop spoilers and shit, it's super fucking obnoxious. Um, when she learned the only way to escape prosecution was to drop her civil suit, she went to the, uh, to the University of Alabama's counseling staff, a staff that turned her away. Why? Because the therapist knew the Bunn family from fundraising efforts and therefore could not help her. Ultimately, her family decided that it was no longer safe for her to even stay in Tuscaloosa. So, before even finishing out her semester, she withdrew from the university. She did everything by the book. Every single thing was done by the book. She tried to get out. She tried to tell him no. She tried to escape. She tried to defend herself. She tried to report it at the ER. She tried to report it to the police. And what happened? The entirety of the apparatus surrounding her turned against her. She became the criminal. She became the perpetrator. She became the person who was hauled through the court of public opinion locally. He became the poor rich boy who was some harlot attempted to take advantage of him. Fun fact. The county district attorney's office that Tuscaloosa finds itself in can't tell you how many sexual assault cases Tuscaloosa ha uh, have occurred uh, that in Tuscaloosa have led to formal charges. This is a direct quote from Chief Deputy Jonathan Cross. I'm ashamed to say we don't know, which is a sort of black eye in our office. Because they didn't start tracking it until late last year. Here's some fun quotes. When asked about the firearm, I was never going to hurt anybody with it, Megan said while crying. I got it to protect myself. I don't even I don't eat meat. I could never kill anything. Even if it came to that point, I wouldn't have been able to use it on a person. The investigator, returning to her rape allegations during the interview, based on your statements to me, you said that you never resisted him. I did resist him, Megan said, listing the ways she did from repeatedly telling Bun she wanted to leave to turning away when he kissed. I wanted to go home. He didn't take me home. Look at it from my side, the piece of shit by the name of Jones said. You never kicked him or hit him or tried to resist him. A few minutes later, after this interrogation and the pressing by the investigator, who God I hope there's a hell for. Megan no longer even knew she, she didn't want to press charges. She straight said, I just want to be done. I just want to move on. She didn't see the point in even trying to 
attempt to press charges at that point because the piece of shit investigator made it very clear at that point who was being investigated. And it wasn't the man who raped her. When Bun, dressed in khakis and a button down, came in for his interview with law enforcement the following Monday, you know, as you do when you've been credibly accused of rape, you get to set your own appointment time, if you happen to be worth a few million dollars at least. Both men, the lawyer and Mr. Bun Jr., had just returned from a weekend fishing trip. The investigator, Josh Hastings, literally said as they convened, because it was recorded, when they convened the meeting in a small room, he said, quote, I'll get y'all out of here. They had some spirited talk about fishing, where the fish were biting, Hastings began his questioning. No, no, Bun hadn't seen Megan that night before picking her up, walking home alone. Oh, yes, he had been drinking, but not too much. Um, Not, not, not more than he should for driving. Megan had invited him and his friend into her place, made them drinks, and then chose his, uh, to go to his place, said Bun. We both decided to have consensual sex, according to Mr. Bun Jr., He said, I fell asleep. I wasn't even aware of such activities. He later realized when the police were ringing his doorbell that someone had shot his pistol and he wasn't sure whether it had hit anything and had gone through his wallet. I'm, quote, this is something I'm going to ask the question. It's got to be asked, said the piece of shit investigator Hastings. How come Bun said no one had been at his house the night before? Bun said, well, I didn't recall. So the investigator then handed him a fucking get out of jail free card in the form of, so you ended up collecting your thoughts and coming around. And that's when you remembered you had her over there. Bun said, right. The investigator gave him an alibi. <clears throat> a few moments later, Bun was once again able to recall that Megan was a, quote, very willing participant. Caught on audio recording, after the investigator left the room, Bun, whispering to his lawyer, said, I'll drop the charges if she drops hers. Quote, I won't pursue her if she doesn't pursue me, but I will play hardball if she does. (sighs) In late July, Megan's father said that the district attorney called to let him know Megan's case did not meet the legal definition of sexual assault and would not be brought to a grand jury. Two weeks later, Megan received a letter confirming her her case was closed. But Megan, being the fighter that she was, wasn't done. In August of that year, she hired a lawyer to file a civil suit. She wanted a piece of him. Now, by that point, she had managed to see a therapist. And she told her therapist that she was suing Bun due to the fear that she's not the first person he assaulted, nor would she probably be the last. But she clearly was suffering from PTSD. She stopped going outside because one day she was crossing the street and she saw Bun driving. She, st- uh, she dropped a, a Habitat for Humanity related honors class because S T 
Bun Construction was the sponsor of the class. She texted a friend saying, his influence and wealth is the reason I can't press charges. He's the charming nice one, and I'm the bitch-faced victim. It was that fall that she received a formal diagnosis of PTSD. It was noted by the therapist that she had no previous history of mental illness, uh, mental health issues. But she continued to focus on losing every losing everything as she felt disempowered as those who have been assaulted tend to do. She assumed that the University of Alabama would support her, but they turned their backs on her. She couldn't even take Bun to court in the end. UA refuses to discuss this to any length or means, but it is what it is, of course. We all know how that goes. <clears throat> on February... <laughs> February 21st, she texted a friend and said, like, you just don't want to deal with shit anymore? Friend wrote back, like, every day, dude. What's up with you? How do you like your new school? Megan said, I hate it. I miss how everything used to be. It was that same week she filed intake forms for SMU's mental health center. She wrote in the form in what her concern was that she thought she would be better off dead more than half the time. There was a question on the form that said, had there been any major changes, losses, or crises? She wrote, raped, bullied by police, changed university. She didn't, <laughs> she didn't turn it in. Next to her bed was the form. She took her life. That is the story of Megan Rondini. Now, here's where, here's where Katie Baker comes in. Because remember, I said this is the story about Ms. Baker. Ms. Baker is the absolute titanium ovaried woman who took up Rondini's case. She is the journalist who saw this travesty and said, I'm going to write about it. I'm going to make somebody know. So how is this a story about Ms. Baker, right? Like, how, how do we frame this? Because this is a story about, this is a story about Ms. Uh, Rondini, right? This is a story about Megan and how she got turned absolutely inside out. Well, Ms. Baker wrote a hell of a piece exposing everyone, everyone. She took them all the task. She took Everybody to task. She named names. She named dates. She cited sources. She named everyone. She lit them a fire. She fucking shredded them. All of them. The University of Alabama, the police department, the lawyers, the fucking buns themselves, the detectives, every single person that had a hand in killing Rondini. Ms. Baker raked them over the coals. So the police filed suit against her. Yeah. Yeah, that's how that went down. The police filed suit against Kate, Ms. Katie Baker. That's how that, that's how, what happened. Ms. Baker wrote a story eviscerating this system of corruption, eviscerating this broken system, exposing it for the misogynistic, abusive pieces of shit that it is and filled with. 
So the cops sued her. They couldn't file criminal charges, so they brought civil suits. Well, just this last week, Ms. Baker's case found itself finally handled by a federal court. And the federal court said she was doing her job. And there was no defamatory statements. There was nothing of criminal conduct on the part of Katie Baker. She did every last bit of due diligence. She dotted her I's and crossed her T's. She was held to a journalistic standard, the likes of which most cops could never even comprehend. And it was dismissed. The federal court said, fair play. So, Megan is dead. Though the instrument was her own hand, the person who wielded it was... T.J. Bunn Jr., T.J. Bunn Sr., the University of Alabama. Um, It was the Tuscaloosa Police Department. It was the Mental Health Center at the University of Alabama. It was the township of Tuscaloosa. It was so many people that killed Megan. It's a rough one. But with that horrid, horrid story, we are actually done with Popo's Bizarre Adventures. It's weird crying on stream, right? Like this is, this is weird. It's, it's weird to have like a a room full of people look at you as you get emotionally worked up, right? Whereas we as people um, are used to laughter. We're used to sharing laughter, right? We're used to um, sharing anger, right? But tears tend to make us uncomfortable because it's, it's a vulnerability, But if you can hear that story and not get worked up, I don't trust you. I don't trust you. It's that simple. Like, Jesus Christ. That is all of the reasons. Good on you, Cassidy. That is all of the reasons, basically in a nutshell, why I'm an anarchist. Look at the abuse of power. Look at the coercive nature. Look at the hierarchical power structures. Look at the monopolization of force. Look at the paternalistic behavior patterns. Look at the marginalized individual who is powerless in that situation. Look at all of that organizational structure that came to bear against the victim. That story is essentially an encapsulation of why I'm an anarchist. Because no one should ever be empowered that way. No one should ever feel that helpless and victimized by a system that allows for that monopolization of force. That should never have occurred. Never. And so when people come at me and with that inevitable question as an anarchist, Well, what about the rapists? What about them? Please, tell me. What about them? Because just as that person earlier who was in here asking about anarchy leading to the witch trials, I'm sorry, what? Who who or what led to what? Because as near as I can tell, the death of Megan Rondini 
is a direct result of a coercive hierarchical economic system that has created a power structure within a political system that allowed for the abuse of an elite, an oligarch, to take advantage of a college-age woman who then turned to the same state-empowered power structure that should have by all accounts, supposedly defended this victim. But what it did was deny her experience, disempower her as a victim, and then attack her directly. The support structure of the university, the very mental health care system that she was supposed to be taken, uh, taken care of by, turned their backs against her because, again, they're allowed to because they have a fucking conflict of interest. Why? Because they have they have an economic gain to be made from that powerful individual. Every single fucking thing in the story of Megan Rondini and Katie Baker is countered by an anarchistic operating methodology. Every single fucking point along that could not have happened to either of them under an anarchistic structure. Not a single fucking thing. That problem would have been solved immediately. One way or the other. One way or the other. Either the immediate response would have handled TJ Bunn Jr. Or the, res the reparative or restorative justice process would have. Either way, we would have isolated him from the victim and removed him and segregated him from society because he is a clear and present danger to members of society. We have solutions for this. We have methodologies for this. And only because of the intrinsic, inherent nature of this system was that allowed to occur. It is because of capitalism. It is because of uh, statism. It is because of oligarchism. It is because of propaganda. It is because of all of these things that Megan Rondini was raped by T.J. Bunn Jr. And she was so victimized by every single step, every single group that should have helped her victimized her further to the point where she was completely powerless. All autonomy, all power of that young, young woman was removed from her. And she saw no other way out. And frankly, I don't know if there was another way out. Tell me, how would it have gotten better? Explain to me. Make it clear. If Megan had decided to fight through, her, her rapist showed clear and present willingness to continue to victimize her using the, uh, using the economic and legal mechanisms within society. She was not done being a victim. She was not done. It would have gotten worse. This is not a situation where it gets better. Her rapist was a powerful individual who showed a willingness on fucking tape to continue to abuse the political and legal and economic systems that he was empowered by to further victimize her and potentially others. So please, please, if you ever do tell this story, if you ever do mention this to somebody, don't sully Megan's name by saying it's a shame she took her life, her own life. It's... It's a kindness at that point. And that is the travesty of our system. That's the horror. Is that the truth of the matter? Is that 
Yeah, it probably was the better option, which is horrid, which is horrid.